morning, Southside. Good to see everybody this morning. Yes. As you can see, Brother David and Teresa are not here today. Uh, Mr. and Mimi Anna visiting friends and family. I believe they, somebody said they went to a class reunion. So just uh, wish and pray that, that they have a good time and uh, that they have a safe uh, trip home today. Uh, just a few announcements this morning. Uh, first, if you're a first time visitor, we want to welcome you this morning. And, uh, let you know that uh, we're honored that you're here. Uh, also, I wanted to mention that uh, there is a connect card in the seat right in front of you. If you'd like to fill that out, uh, no pressure. We'd like to have a record of your visit. And uh, there's also a place for prayer requests. If you could put that in there too, and just leave that on the seat, and then we'll come by later and pick that up. Uh, and, and two, if you're a, a first time a visitor, uh, we've got a, a mission. Uh, 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 that we're doing tonight for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, we're going to be doing some unboxing and some organizing. And I believe Frank has cooked some food, some Boston butts. Yeah. And then there's uh, what we need traits, we need dessert, Sides. and sides. Uh, and that starts at 5 o'clock this evening. And after church, if everybody help move the chairs out of the way and set up a couple of tables, that'd be nice. Okay, you can get to move the chairs. So, yeah, we'd love to have you tonight for that. And uh, another reminder is on Wednesday night, of course, we have the youth Bible study. And uh, the church uh, goes out and gets food. We just ask people to go get that food and bring it here. And I think that has to be here by 6. Is that right? 6 o'clock? 545. 545. Yeah, 545. Uh, I don't know if anybody's noticed that... Uh, Youth is really growing. We're doing a good job. Yeah. Every week, right Sunday, youth Do you really? That's great. Yeah, I see pictures uh, that somebody put on Facebook this last week. It's like, wow. Yeah, 18. 18. That's great. Yeah. Great. Good job. And uh, of course, Brother Dave has been mentioning I think, the past two weeks on the 24th, the Clear Creek uh, Bible students will be doing the worship service. And after the service, we'll be providing the food. Uh, I think the main course is provided. We just see again the sides and, and the desserts and things like that. Uh, if you have any questions on that, we we'll give your brother David. Uh, let's see. What else do we have here? Hey, Bobby, I asked him about a head count. He said somewhere between 20 and 25. 20 and 25. Okay. Gotcha. And I guess he's still kind of heading that up as far as what to bring, brother David. I don't think anybody else is assigned to it, are they? That's what's in the book. Okay. 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 Uh, I wanted to introduce Rob Patterson this morning. Rob's going to be uh, doing our, our, our service this morning, giving the message. Uh, Rob is from Louisville, has a uh, wife, Jenny, two children, uh, what, Hallie? Haley. And ha Haley and Hallie Grace? Is that right? Hannah and Haley Grace. Hanny. Hannah and Haley Grace, okay. But uh, you're uh, with the KBC. And uh, you're over the, uh, actually, the leader of the evangelism team. So great. great. Good to have you this morning. We're honored to have you. So, in just a few minutes, uh, Rob will be giving the message. Yeah, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, God, for your love. Lord. We just praise you, God. And uh, we just know, Lord, that you're worthy of our worship this morning, God. Uh, you are a master. You are a creator. And we just pray, God, that our eyes and our ears are open this morning, God, that we receive your message, Lord, and as Brother Rob, Rob presents that, God, and just, uh, we pray, God, that you speak through Brother Rob and give him the words, Lord, that you want presented this morning to convict us, Lord, of our sin and to just uh, change our hearts, Lord. And if anyone here today that doesn't know you, God, I just pray, God, that you open their heart, God, that they receive you this morning, Lord. And we just thank you for our pastor. We thank you, God, for his leadership, for his word, for his teaching, Lord. And just uh, thank you for his faith. And, and, and with Teresa, uh, Lord, we thank you for both of them, God. We just ask that you protect them and just uh, bring them home safe. Uh, and again, we just pray that the Holy Spirit speak, speaks through Brother Rob this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Children are dismissed to Children's Church at this time. Everyone else, stand and greet your neighbor this morning.
everyone, go, go ahead and have a seat. We've had some technical difficulties this morning. So we're going to move on. Is that it? We can't hear it up here. Okay. We will move on. Emma, come right on up. I love to hear this young lady sing. And I hope this is going to work with her song. Go ahead and start hers and see if it's going to play. Okay. Don't you just love technology? We've got a new computer and a new slide program, and, and it was all working fine early. And all of a sudden, it don't want to work. Is it working? She's got the red. It was just one more minute. So we're having a meeting tonight. There's food. Typ typical Baptist meeting, right? And then we got another meeting next Sunday. Right afterwards, we got food. Y'all like that, don't you? Well, you get to preach longer today, Rob. Right? I think they have a different idea in mind, Brother James. Hey, good morning, church family. Good morning. It is so good to be with you, and you, you have no idea how happy I am that you're here. Uh, Pastor David invited me to Gracious to come back. It's been a couple of years since I've been with you, and so I knew you had relocated. I had celebrated that at a distance. Pastor David gave me the correct address. But I got behind the wheel this morning, and out of instinct, I drove to the old location and uh, pulled in the parking lot, and I kind of started thinking, well, uh, I know that some people stay away when the pastor's gone, but surely somebody's going to go out there today. And, uh, and then I remembered, oh, well, of course nobody's here, Brother Rod, here's the wrong place. And so how much more exciting to come and see you gather this morning. Hey, it is so good to be with you. If you have your Bibles there, and I trust that you do, I invite you to follow along with me to Mark chapter 2. I'm going to be looking at an incredible text this morning, one of my favorite stories, and we have so many of those in God's Word, don't we? And as was mentioned earlier, I have the incredible privilege in this season of life of serving as your evangelism team leader with the Kentucky Baptist Convention. And 
working with all of our cooperating churches as we try to partner together to reach Kentucky and the world for Christ. And so trying to create opportunities for us to come alongside one another in meaningful ways for evangelism is what I try and do on a regular basis. And as we come to Scripture this morning, I think we're going to be reminded of the importance of that and what that can look like for us as a local church, as a convention of churches today. And I'm looking forward to being able to share this story with you with fresh eyes, and I pray it might stretch it. Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, the Bible tells us when he had returned to Capernaum after some days, it was heard that he was uh, at home. And many came together so that there was no more room now picture it, not even at the door. And when he was preaching the word to him, to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic who was carried by four men. When they could not get near him because of the crowd, uh, the translation I'm reading this morning says they removed the roof above him. <laughs> and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes who were sitting there, questioning their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your bed and go home. Verse 12, and he rose and immediately picked up his bed and he went out before them all so that they were all amazed, glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. May God add a blessing to the reading, now the preaching of his word. Church, I don't know about you, one of the first truths that jumps out to me as we look at this story again today is we, each of us, must be willing to take up our corner of somebody else's map because no one finds his or her way to Jesus alone. No one finds his or her way to Jesus alone. Let me show it to you if I can the text. There's no indication, is there, as we hear the story, whose idea it was originally to bring this paralyzed man to Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, I think most of us probably assume it was the paralyzed man, right? Uh, it's easy to imagine a scenario whereby he's heard these stories about this miracle worker named Jesus who's healed all kinds of people of all kinds of diseases. And I can imagine him asking friend, asking family, asking anybody he could get to listen, hey, I want to go see this Jesus. Could you please help me get to Jesus? Easy to imagine that scenario. But I confess, after 30 years of ministry, I can also imagine the exact opposite possibly being true. It might have been one of the four friends who had to come to the paralyzed man and convince him to go. Hey, listen, we know you don't want to. We know you, you've already tried everything, but, but what could it hurt? Well, let's just go see what maybe Jesus could do. While we'll never know this side of heaven, whose idea it was to bring this paralyzed man to Christ, there is one truth that's immediately obvious, isn't there? There's no scenario whereby this paralyzed man could have come to Christ alone. Now, we're not trying to be insensitive or crude with that statement. We're just being honest, right? In a first century Palestine and all the challenges that would have existed, it just simply wouldn't have been possible. And while that's obvious for a paralyzed man, I don't know that it's immediately evident to us why that same principle applies spiritually. But think with me just a second, church, about the language that the Bible uses to describe those who've not yet come to Jesus. What are some of the ways the Bible describes those folks? Lost, right? Blind. My goodness, one text even says dead in their trespasses and sin. Now, again, we're not being judgy. We're not, we're not any of that, but we need to be honest. And in John chapter 6, 44, Jesus declares the spiritual reality for us. 
In John 6, 44, Jesus tells us, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Start right there, John 6, 44. Use the concordance in your Bible or any set of good Bible study tools, and you're going to find verse after verse that teach that same spiritual reality. No one comes to God. No one finds God. My goodness, nobody even starts looking for God until the Holy Spirit of God first begins to draw him or her. Now, I understand when we share our stories, we, we use language oftentimes about looking for God, right, or finding God. And, and I understand that because from our side of the story, that's what it feels like. But in that moment when you've truly been found, I don't know about you, but I realized, oh my goodness, you know, I was so far off course. I, I was so turned around. I was so lost. I never would have found my way to God if God hadn't first come looking for me. And aren't you glad that he does this morning? That brings us to the practical reality. Nobody finds his or her way to Jesus alone because we, we don't know he's what we're looking for. Even in this moment, when these four friends are going through all of this to try to bring their buddy to Christ, they don't see his real need, not really. Now, of course, he's got an obvious physical need. And you can't help but see it. You immediately empathize. I don't know about you, but first word of the story, I'm cheering this guy on, aren't you? You want to see him walk again? Of course we do. And, and I think that's maybe why Jesus is the only one in this whole story who could recognize this man's greatest need was not his most obvious need. Didn't occur to the man on the mat, didn't occur to the, the guys carrying him in, didn't occur to, to, to anyone who was there in that particular moment. And oftentimes, I'm afraid it doesn't occur to us that, that, that our real need, that the greatest need of our friends, that, that the greatest need of our community probably isn't what seems most obvious to us. It's something much deeper than that. And as we look at the story, we're reminded today that there's a spiritual thing that keeps us from coming. There's a practical reality that keeps us from coming. But we pull back and we ask ourselves for a moment, what good would it have done this man to walk if he had to walk without Jesus? There's no way as a guest driving in and, and even starting out at the wrong church that I could know what's going on in your life this morning. But friend, here's something I can promise you. There is nothing you need today anymore than you need Jesus. The church family, there's nothing we need any more of than we need more of Jesus. That's why I encourage you, I urge you this morning to come or to Come back fresh again to, to Jesus. And, and church, it's why I urge you, we, we have to keep taking up the corner of somebody else's mat. We have to keep doing whatever we can to help one more and one more find their way to Christ. They cannot come unless God draws them. But this story and so many others are hearing God's word to remind us, more often than not, how does God choose to do that drawing? Through people like us, right? You know, I read the story and, and sometimes I think, gosh, it'd be cool to know their names at least. You know, wouldn't you like to know a little bit more about the story of these four guys? But then I'm immediately grateful that God in his infinite wisdom, when the Holy Spirit inspired Mark to write this story down, he just left them as four nameless dudes. You know why that's important? Because that means they could be anybody, right? There's nothing unique or extraordinary about these four friends except... They were willing, they were available when an opportunity presented itself to take up the corner of somebody else's mat. That brings us, I think, to an important question for you and I today. What is it that's holding you back? What is it that's keeping you from being available, from being willing to take up the corner of someone else's mat? Now, we're going to have to move quickly here today, even though i got a little more time. Brother James won't abuse that. Uh, but I see at least five things in the story. And I want to call them to your attention because if they were true for them, I can't help but think that they're oftentimes probably true for many of us as well this morning. So here we go. First, I think we miss out on what God is doing when we become distracted. When we, my goodness, do we not live in a day full of distractions today? You know, again, we don't know, the story doesn't tell us 
how many people were invited, how many people had to be asked before they finally got the bare minimum. But experience tells me it's probably more than just four. Don't you think so? Anybody here today ever served on the nominating committee? Can I get an amen right there? Now, I'm not trying to, to pick on you or anything, but, but, but when I read this story, I can't help but wonder, you know, how many people had an opportunity to be a part of this incredible, life-changing story that's been recorded even in God's Word, and yet they missed out on it simply because they thought they couldn't make the time. As I look out across the church at, at this wonderful church family, I, I can't help but wonder how many of us might be missing out on what God really wants to do because we've allowed ourselves to become so busy and so involved with so many good things. Yeah, I'm sure they're good things, but we get so busy with so many good things that oftentimes we don't have enough margin. We don't have availability in our life when God wants to invite us into His thing. And so we miss out oftentimes on what God's really wanting to do simply because we've allowed ourselves to get distracted. Secondly, we miss out on what God is doing when we become discouraged. Discouraged. You ever carried another person physically before? You know, sometimes we've had that experience in a trust exercise or PE class or some other kind of thing. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of carrying somebody that's like passed out completely, but my goodness, when somebody's just like dead weight, it seems like they weigh, what, 10 times more than they really do, and it's like awkward, and it's, it's complicated and all of that. We have no idea how far these buddies had to carry their friend on a mat. What we do know from experience is they wouldn't have gone very far at all, would they, before they began to feel it right there in that shoulder. That shoulder begins to burn, and that begins, you know, if we could ask them in heaven today, hey, how far did you carry him? I guarantee they would say, far enough. Like, it was far enough, right, brother, right? And some of you come this morning and you're just discouraged. You're discouraged in your personal evangelism. You might be discouraged in the efforts of your, your class or your church to try and reach a particular friend or neighbor because if we're honest, praying for the lost, praying for our ones, that can be heavier than it seems like it ought to be, can it? And oftentimes it takes longer to see fruit. Sometimes it takes longer to see that spiritual breakthrough in somebody else's life than we hope or we feel like it should and if we aren't careful we easily get discouraged i think the story's here to remind us this morning don't be discouraged saint because you're not meant to carry that weight alone evangelism is always a, a team effort isn't it first of all working together with the lord but also working together with one another and that's the beauty of a church family all we say is hey listen you take up your corner of the mat We'll take up our corner of the mat. Together we'll help carry this load. Together we'll find a way. Together in time we'll get one more and one more to Jesus. So don't be discouraged. Thirdly, we miss out on what God's doing if we let ourselves be defeated. If we let that discouragement grow into defeat. Man, you read this story and these guys have overcome all these obstacles and probably dozens more we'll never know about. And yet verse 4 tells us they still could not get near to Jesus. How defeating. And some of you, you feel that same emotion here this morning just because when it, just when it seemed like that family member was finally about to turn things around, just when it seemed like your friend was ready to really come to faith in Christ, just when it seemed like we were about to break through, boom, out of nowhere, you run into this barrier that you never saw coming and this obstacle that suddenly you find yourself two or three steps back but thankfully we've already heard the end of the story and we know there's no scenario where these four guys were going to give up right there's no way they're going to be defeated but but look again verse four when they could not get near him because of the crowd they removed the roof above him one translation i think captures it more accurately by saying when they had dug through <laughs> they lowered the man on the bed on which the paralytic lay. Now, church, this is one of those stories. We've heard this so many times over the years. I think we sort of sanitize the scene a little bit, don't we? But you've got to get the picture of what's going on here to really have the impact Jesus wants us to. It's a full house. There's no standing room, not even at the door. And Jesus is preaching and teaching the word to them. And in that amazing moment of ministry, there is this 
distracting noise that starts happening up overhead, and, and it doesn't go away. And, and if, if they had had a sound booth back then, you know everybody in the room would have been looking back at the poor fellas in the back trying to figure out what's going wrong, right? But now the, the distraction has grown into full-blown disruption because, first of all, there's dust and this increasing noise, and now there's, can you, can you think about it? Pieces of debris are like falling on people's heads as there's now a hole being opened in this poor guy's roof. And don't you know, Jesus long ago gave up preaching. There's no preaching going on anymore. Everybody in that whole house is looking up, their mouths hanging as wide open as the hole that just opened up, and they're like, is this really going on? Yes! Yes! And you've got to see this to understand the impact of this story. But even when we begin to see it, I'm afraid, you know, some 2,000 years later, we look back and instead of really being impacted or inspired by that, we begin to pick it apart a little bit and we begin to scrutinize. If we're not careful, criticize. It's almost easy to look back and say, well, my goodness, why didn't these four guys just go sit under an olive tree until Jesus was done? You know, like this is excessive. This is literally going over the top, right? Until... Until you're the one that's laying on that mat. Or until it's your friend or family member who's on that mat. And in that moment, I ask you, church, short of sin, what would you not be willing to do to see your friend saved? Short of sin, what would we not be willing to do to see the lost saved? Now, that may not be the attitude of the average Kentucky Baptist today, but praise God it was the attitude of these four friends. And this is an incredible moment. Look at verse 5. Don't miss this. I think this is an important truth for us today. Verse 5 says, When Jesus saw whose faith? Their faith. He says to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. That's not what we expect Jesus to say there, is it? Now, let's don't get it wrong. Obviously, the, the, the paralyzed man is in the process of coming to faith in Jesus. Otherwise, there's no scenario whereby his sins could have been forgiven. But in this moment, Jesus doesn't choose to call attention to his faith, but rather their faith. Why? Because he wants us to understand today, church, that if our friends are going to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, it demands of you and I, a faith that will not allow ourselves to be distracted with other secondary things, that will not allow us to become discouraged or to become defeated, that won't let anything get in the way, but will do what it takes to help put one more, one more, one more in front of Jesus. That's why I encourage you, I urge you this morning, we can't let ourselves become disengaged from the mission. We miss out on what God's doing. Fourthly, when we become disengaged from the mission, no matter how many times I read this story, the, the thing that is deflating to me is that when you really look at it, what's the obstacle, what's the barrier that's actually keeping these guys from getting their friend to Jesus? It's a religious crowd. It's a religious gathering. Now think with me for a minute. What could be any more defeating than to have gone through all of this, to literally have your friend at the door, and not a single person is willing to make any room for him. Can you imagine that? How, how defeating that would have been. Hey, listen, Southside, why is it so important that we as churches have a phenomenal first impressions ministry, that we designate parking for guests, that we always have an available seat and material available, that we continue to remind ourselves we have to look at least as much outward as we do inward. Because listen, every Sunday could be somebody's first Sunday. Isn't that true? And if any Sunday could be somebody's first Sunday, church, we got to keep making room for one more. Amen? And I'm just, I just want to, I want to remind me, and I want to caution you this morning, the moment we stop really making room for one more in our hearts, you're in danger of maybe becoming nothing more than just a religious huddle, a religious crowd. And the story's here to remind us that's been one of the biggest obstacles that have kept people from coming to Jesus from the very beginning. But now that's not who you are. 
And that's certainly not who you want to be, but, but don't deceive yourself. It can happen easily to any one of us, can it? It can happen to any local church if we're not careful. And so fifthly, we miss out on what God's doing when we allow ourselves to be deceived. And we see that in this story. Verses 6 and 7. Some scribes were sitting there, and they're questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, when the Bible tells us these are scribes, we immediately know, don't we, that in one manner of speaking, there, there's no one in that day and time who knew more about the Word of God than the scribes would have. That's their job, right? Literally, every day, meticulously, by hand, letter by letter, they're copying the Word of God. They had an incredibly intentional process to make sure that there were no mistakes, that it was checked and triple-checked, because that's how they preserved the Word of God. That's how they protected the Word of God. That's how they passed on the Word of God. And they took it seriously. So in one manner of speaking, no one had any more head knowledge of Scripture than the scribes. But here's the, the tragedy. They've become so puffed up in that head knowledge They've become so self-righteous, they don't recognize the Son of God, the long way to Messiah, when He's sitting right in front of their eyes. Now again, it's too easy for us, isn't it, 2,000 years later to look back and, well, what's their problem? And, you know, pick it on them. But can I be honest? If you were to ask me this morning, hey, Brother Rob, who do you, who do you think you have the most in common with when you look at these stories in the Gospels? You know, think about that. Who do you think you have the most... Now, we want to say Jesus, right? But none of us have that kind of moxie. We're all trying to become more like Christ. But when we read a story, we're not going to say, yeah, I think I'm the Jesus. No, we're not going to go there. But, but we do want to be the people who follow Christ, right? The ones who, who trust Him. The, the ones who, who are willing to step out for Him. That's who I want to be. But if I'm honest with you, a lot of the stories I read, if you pin me down, I'd have to say the ones I have the most in common with, the scribes and the Pharisees. You see, I'm a pretty religious person these days. I, I've been following Jesus a long time. Shucks, I've been in ministry 30 years now. And i got to be honest, somebody comes and starts tearing a hole in our roof, Brother James, I don't care if that's literally or figuratively, I don't know that my first response is, well, praise Jesus. You know, I, that's, just not, that's not where I go, right? But I don't want to be the Pharisee in this story, do you? Man, I don't want to ever find myself criticizing what God's doing. I, I don't ever want to deceive myself into thinking, I've so got God figured out, I, I so know how God works, that, that I can't join God when He wants to do something radically different and new. What about you? So let me ask you this morning, what is it that's, that's holding you back? By no means is that an exhaustive list, but I think those five categories are broad enough, aren't they, that Probably every one of us at some point in our walk could find ourselves in one of those five areas. The question for today is, where are you right now? And what, if any, adjustments might we need to make so that we can really join God in what it is He's wanting to do in our life and through His church? I want to quickly, just really quickly, show you what can happen when we do, okay? First, when we help our ones come to Jesus, when we help our friends come to Christ, we have an opportunity to see God like never before, to see Him move unlike anything before. Now again, the, the, the problem, you know this, the, the problem in the text, the tension doesn't come because the scribes don't understand who Jesus is claiming to be, right? Quite the opposite. No one has authority to forgive sins but God in heaven alone. They have that exactly right. And so when Jesus begins publicly to claim I've got authority to do on earth what only God in heaven can do. It's not that the scribes were sitting there scratching their heads saying, well, I don't understand. No, they knew exactly what he's claiming. And in fact, it's because they understood so well that they began to respond with indignation and even anger. But, but look, if you will, how Jesus confronts their stinking thinking. Verse 6, some scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Now, I read that again because I don't want you to miss it. This is not one of those scenarios where somebody is whispering in the back of the room. You ever had that experience? You're in the middle of a meeting and somebody's not real happy how it's going. And so instead of just saying that, they kind of start whispering to their neighbor. That's not what's going on here. The Bible is very, very clear. No one has said a single thing out loud. It's all going on internally. But verse 8, immediately Jesus perceiving in his spirit 
they thus question within themselves, says to them, why do you question these? Now, my goodness, could you imagine how shocked they would have been right then? How taken aback you would be? You're just kind of there off in your own thoughts and you're wrestling with some questions and you think it's, and then suddenly Jesus just calls that out loud. How in the world could he know what I was thinking? Well, the psalmist tells us, before the words are formed on my lips, Lord, you already know them. At church, we, we can't afford to miss the incredible gospel intentionality of Jesus in this whole encounter by showing them that he knows what only God could possibly know. He's trying to give proof for them. He's trying to give proof for us that he has the ability to do what only God can do because this is a critical moment. And what Jesus is trying to help us see is that as impossible as it was in that day, as impossible as it continues to be in our day to heal a man of paralysis, that's nothing. That, that's nothing in comparison to forgiving that same man of his sin. Jesus understands that. Why? Because he's the one who came to pay the price for those sins. Now, the, the guy laying on the mat, he doesn't understand it. And we, we understand why. We wouldn't dare be critical of him. And in this moment, he's thinking what? Man, if I could just walk again, everything would be okay. His four friends, they don't really comprehend it. They're just trying to do a good thing, right? They're just trying to help a friend. They're just trying to meet a need, and surely that's good enough. And the scribes and Pharisees, my goodness, they sure don't get it because they've deceived themselves into thinking, well, if I can just be religious enough, if I could just be moral enough, man, if I could just be better than that guy, surely I can earn my way into heaven. And, and you know what? Many of us still don't really understand it. And I wonder, what are... What are some of the lies we're telling ourselves even right here today? Some of us are still telling ourselves, you know, if I, if I could just get that. Oh, if it, if it just wasn't for this. Oh, if we could ever go. And so Jesus knows our propensity to kind of deceive ourselves and to, to go looking for what only he can provide in some other way. And knowing that, he just calls all that out graciously and kindly he just calls out verses 9 and 10. What's easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. Now look at verse 10. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So in other words, so that you'll know he has the ability to do the much, much harder thing. I say to you, rise, take up your bed and go home. So don't miss it. Jesus heals the paralyzed man not simply to, to compassionately meet that physical need as amazing and awe-inspiring and worship-inspiring as that is, but he heals him the way that he heals him to prove to him, to prove to us that he has the ability to meet his spiritual need, to meet his deeper need, to meet the greater need in his life. Listen, your sins can be forgiven today. But one reason and one reason only. In the person of Jesus, your sins have already rightfully been judged because he took our place, died for our sins, was buried, and three days later rose again so that he can bring life, forgiveness, and eternal life to anyone who would repent of their sins and come to Jesus this morning. I urge you today, would you come today and surrender your life to christ it's true god can meet any need in your life through jesus this morning but aren't you glad that he came to meet our greatest need the need that only he can meet? And that's why when we help our friends come to jesus we have an opportunity to, to see lives genuinely changed lives genuinely changed immediately immediately this man has a better current reality doesn't he but more miraculous, he has been given a better eternal destiny. You know, we asked earlier, what good would it have done this man to walk if he had to walk without Jesus? As I come in this morning, I know some of us convince ourselves that we're, we're making our own way in this world, that we're standing on our own two feet. And I know in one way that's a Kentucky ethic, and I respect it, admire it. We pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. But I would also say to you, at some points, you got to stop and ask yourself, where's this road really taking me? 
And I would say to you this morning, only Jesus can change the trajectory of your life. Only Jesus can meet that deepest need. Only Jesus, the only one who died and rose again, can give you life after death. And I urge you to come and bring your life to Christ this morning. And church, when, when people do, when we, when we help our ones come to Christ, we have a chance to see God glorified in our church and our community. Verse 12. And he rose. <laughs> you can't read over that. And the paralyzed man, right? He rose, immediately picked up his bed, and he went out before them all so that they all were amazed, right? And glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Southside Baptist Church, wouldn't you like to be a part of something we've never seen before? For all the amazing things God's already done in your life, for all the amazing things God's doing through your church, wouldn't you like to be a part of something that's so amazing that everybody from doubters to disciples, skeptics to scholars, and anybody in between, they have no choice except to give glory to God and say, man, we've never seen anything like this. I believe we can. Because the same Jesus of the story is the Jesus who's with us today, the Jesus who's available to you today, and he's still inviting common folks, average folks like us, to join him in taking up the corner of somebody else's mat. And so don't miss this. As we close, you, you can't miss it. It's one of the coolest parts of the story, I think. Hey, don't forget that when the four friends got to the door with their buddy, there wasn't a single person willing to make any room for him. But notice verse 11, when Jesus says, rise, pick up your bed, and go home, do you notice suddenly everybody starts making room now? <laughs> the path is wide open. As physically, I think they were so awestruck by the power of Almighty God that was just put on display through Jesus that they physically began to take a step back and their mouths are hanging wide open. I can't help but think that once paralyzed man got a little Baptocostal, don't you? As he grabbed that bed, it probably danced right out the back of that place all the way home. What about you this morning? Hey, what would keep you from coming to Jesus today? Packs wide open because Jesus already made a way. There's absolutely nothing standing between you and coming to Christ this morning except your willingness to do so. Your willingness to turn away from your sin and come and put your trust in Christ. We invite you to come. Just a moment, we're going to stand, we're going to sing. It's a hymn of response. I invite you to come. We'd love to talk to you about how you could come to Christ. As some hopefully come for the first time bringing their life to Jesus. There may be some of us this morning, quietly, privately, between us and just the Lord. You may need to come this morning and just, just have a conversation with God. Lord, forgive me, I don't know when. But God, I let my, I've let myself get distracted. God, God I've got to let myself get so busy that, that I've really not been available, but I want to be. God, God, could you help me get my priorities realigned this morning? Some of us today might just have to come and just humbly before the Lord say, God, forgive me. I don't, I don't know how it happened. I don't, it's not who I want to be, but so, somewhere I stopped making room in my heart for one more. God, God, would you open my heart? God, would you break my heart for what breaks yours? God, would you, I don't want to get in the way of what you want to do. God, would you work in me? Some of us just may need to come this morning and have a conversation with the Lord. Others of you, I'm convinced, as we've heard the story about this friend, the Holy Spirit's been laying on your heart the name of a friend, a family member, someone that still needs to come to Christ. And I would invite you during our time of, of invitation that you might just come and as an act of just, Lord, I just, I'm making myself available. God, I'm physically coming to the front as, as just a way of me saying to you, Lord, if you can use me, please use me and help him bring my friend, help him bring one more. To Jesus. Other decisions you may need to make today, whatever the Holy Spirit would lead you to do, we want to provide opportunity to do it. If you'd stand, we'll pray. Pastor James will come and lead us in a, in a hymn of invitation. Father, we, we thank you to know that for all we've ever seen you do, God, you're capable of doing so much more. Now, Father, we thank you that while we may not have experienced physical healing like the amazing story we read here, all of us that have been saved have experienced an incredible miracle, a greater miracle of coming from death to life spiritually. 
God, I, I just pray in this moment, as your Holy Spirit leads, as your Holy Spirit speaks, God, would you find us available? God, would you find us willing to join you in whatever you would ask us to do for the name of Jesus in which we pray? Amen. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time, he has waited before, and now he is waiting again to in Austin. That's right. I guess not. Sometimes the devil works against you, but you just got to let the Lord have his way. Great message this morning, and I wonder if anybody's got anything on their heart before we leave today. You don't want to leave and... Uh, miss a blessing anybody got anything on your heart this morning okay